Okay, the time is now 4.32. The meeting will start. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Shaw. How right. are you? All right. I'm good. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to welcome everybody um, to our general membership meeting. This will be the last general membership meeting for the summer, unless something really important happens. Other than that, we're going to break for the summer. Um, if anything requires our attention, that your attention, I, that I need you to know about, we'll do either the newsletter or we'll call a meeting. Um, tonight, we're going to have some people come and speak to us. We have um, Councilwoman um, Vanessa Gibson. Um, she's on her way in. I mean, not physically, but she'll be joining us shortly. We have an um, update on our EEO from um, Erica from our um, EEO team on the case. We have our attorney, Harry Greenberg, who'll be updating us on some stuff that's going on, especially with the um, early retirement incentive. And then I'll jump in and give you guys some updates. So Ms. Gibson is not here yet. So Erica, I guess you could jump in, give us your overview before she gets here. Thank sure. you. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, for those of you guys who I haven't met, my name is Erica Healy Kagan. I'm attorney at the Curlin Group. We represent UPOA in a federal court class action right now that uh, makes arguments regarding pay inequalities in probation and um, unequal um, employment processes and procedures. So we filed that case. I think I, I was at your last meeting where I said, you know, we filed the case after the EEOC had investigated it. So we filed it in January of this year in the federal court in the Southern District of New York. Uh, the judge was assigned, the defendants were served. And after you initiate a case, defendants then have an opportunity to respond. And there's a number of ways that they can appear. One of them, uh, in this case, the city appeared and filed what's called a motion to dismiss. And that's a pretty typical procedural mechanism, especially the city in, in many cases. They file that type of motion and they try to see if they can get any aspects of the case knocked out, uh, You know, usually with varying degrees of success, but plaintiffs always have an opportunity to respond. Uh, and so over the past couple of months, that's what's been happening is they filed the motion, we responded and rebutted all of their arguments. They then were able to file a response. And then just last week, we were able to file, uh, in essence, an additional rebuttal to their arguments. So now the court has all the papers on the motion, uh, and we're now waiting to hear from the judge if she'd like to hold oral argument, if she has any questions for the parties, need any additional briefing. Uh, but basically right now we are uh, you know, waiting to hear from the judge about what the next steps will be. So we'll keep everyone updated. I know we might not have a meeting over the next few months, but we can send out updates. Uh, you know, any, any significant progress, uh, we'll certainly of course, let Dalvany know and let the executive team know, and we'll keep everyone updated on the progress. But uh, we're, you know, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, sometimes, you know, with litigation, that can there can be some waiting periods. But as soon as we have more information about next steps, we'll keep everyone updated. Okay, Erica, thank you. So, um, so what we'll do is we'll while I think Harry, you want to come in, or you want me to do something before Miss Gibson? Gets no, no, I'll, I'll, these are both short issues. Okay, go ahead. Everybody's interested in the early retirement incentive. It was a bill introduced in Albany and uh, it was sent back to committee because there were errors in the drafting. So until it, it it's get, gets fixed and reintroduced, uh, there's nothing too much for us to do. If it actually gets done before June, the end of June, um, if we're not in it, we'll have our lobbyist or whoever uh, go forward and ask for us to be included. And, and really it's like, there's a whole list of groups. We'll just be one of the groups. So uh, that being the case, uh, there's really nothing much to report. It's not in the law, it's, but the way it was drafted, which was ev evidently defective, it's up to the local governments to decide whether and who uh, will be given the opportunity to get uh, some enhancement of their pension or, or, or by either having one month for every year up to 36 months or, or things like that. So, so that's the update. So if somebody tells you the law is passed, it's not. It's being redrafted. As far as the retiree advantage Medicare, 
I expect uh, that uh, the mediator is going to be issuing his report and all good stuff is going to happen. But until it's signed and done, there's not much to say. But I will tell you this, consistently, both the city and the unions, the MLC, have said that if your doctor is your doctor and you are on Medicare, you'll still have the same doctor. And if you were in a hospital and they accepted Medicare, you'll continue to do that. And we expect there'll be other benefits that you didn't have once this thing is done. But until it's signed, things could change. But I think it's going to be happening in June, sometime in June. And we're in June now. So, so that's my report on those two issues. You're muted, Delvani. To go, move on, so our guest comes. Um, so there was every there was a supervisor promotion exam on, on May 19th, and when before we even began giving the um, the preps for the exams, I encouraged everybody off the bat to start to automatically protest the exam. So many of you did at the at the end of your um, taking the exam, and you clicked the button that said protest. And some, and some of you didn't. So what we did was we made arrangement with with DCAS to make sure that those who didn't um, click the the um, they want that they wanted to protest the exam to have the opportunity for you all to do it. We sent out a blast, and I hope the majority of you guys um, protested it, even if you passed it, because and it can in increase your chances of getting a higher score. Um, Eighty-five percent of it is the test, and if you think about fifteen percent of it is something goes to what once you pass the exam. Goes, um, goes toward your time on service. But the, what I found out is that when you do go for the, you'll be in, you'll, you should receive an invite at some point to come and protest the exam. You didn't get a printout at the time because of the, this is a new way of doing things. When you get there, you'll get your answers and you'll compare your wrong answers to DCAS's correct answers. And then the good thing about it, that whoever's in the room with you at the time, you guys can actually have conversations and have debate about the questions, and that's a good thing. So once that's established, then we have a validation committee that comes, which a representative, two, one or two representatives from the union and department and CCAS are coming, and they'll they'll look at the questions, and then after a certain point, it just, let's get cert certified. It could take a while, have about a year, it's nine months to a year. It varies, but it could take a long time. It could take a long time. So it'll be a while before um, we hear anything on the test. As far as the provisional, Supervisors, I was told, they will be in there, stay in their place until, you know, all everything is um, finalized. Um, the exam for the probation officer, probation officer title, the filing. I'm sure you guys saw the announcement on the department's um, website, I mean, internet emails, and we also put it on ours. It's from June second, twenty one to June twenty two. Um, and also on June twenty second, NICES is having a uh, of uh, a retirement um, information. And if any of you are interested, I'm, I, we put it on our website and the department also put it on their email. Um, you should, if interested, you should in sign up and see more about what the retirement. Um, on May 19th, we had um, a presentation. It was a general membership meeting. I don't, I don't know how many people showed up, but there was a general membership meeting and Mount Sinai did a whole presentation on 9-11 and which you're entitled to very in debt. So right now we're working on, for those who missed it, we're working on getting the link from Mount Sinai so you can actually look at it and find out how you can properly, but there's a proper way of registering. So those of you who worked in Lower Manhattan, Staten Island, I believe New Jersey, that you might want to look into the um, what you're entitled to for the, um, when it comes to 9-11 registry. Another thing, um, Hold on, excuse me one minute. Okay, I'm going to stop right now and understand that Councilwoman, Council Member uh, Vanessa Gibson is now here. She's in, letting her in. And She's um, in. okay, hello, Ms. Gibson. Ms. Gibson is a council council member that represents the Bronx and highly favors probation, especially our neon sites. So without further ado, she's running for um, Bronx Borough President, and she wanted to stop by and talk to you all. So Ms. Gibson, if you're ready, you can have, have the Zoom. Yes, thank you so much, Sister Powell, and good afternoon, everyone, to the United Probation Officers Association. 
It's great to see all of you. I hope that everyone is healthy, well, and safe. It's a great honor and a privilege. And I thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I'll be as brief as I can. Uh, I am council member Vanessa Gibson. I represent district 16 in the West Bronx. I am proud to have been a council member for the past eight years since 2013. And I was reelected in 2017. And now I am serving in my final year in the city council. I will be leaving office at the end of this year. Uh, and I am really proud to represent the residents and families of Claremont, Claremont Village, Concourse, Concourse Village, Highbridge, Mount Eden, Morris Heights, and Morrisania. I represent Yankee Stadium. I represent the Bronx Museum, Roberto Clemente State Park, and I represent the entire 161st Street corridor, which is home to what we call the civic area. I represent housing court, family court, civil court, <laughs> criminal court, the Hall of Justice, the district attorney's office and the Bronx Supreme Court building. <laughs> and okay. it's really, really great because I, I've had a lot of opportunity over my years in the city council to work with a number of partners and stakeholders uh, during my time to really advance the issues that are important to children and families of our community, issues around affordable housing, economic development, public education, access to quality health care, safe streets, and making sure that our young people have opportunities to be success stories and not statistics. And um, it's been mentioned, and I wanna thank you again, Sister uh, Dalvaney Power, thank you very much for reaching out to our office because as I leave the city council and I close this one chapter of public service, I certainly am looking forward to a new chapter of leadership. I wanna take my eight years of experience in the city council overseeing a budget of $95 billion, co-chair of the Women's Caucus, one of the deputy leaders. I am the chair of the Oversight and Investigations Committee, as well as being on the budget and negotiating team. I wanna take all of that experience I have learned and apply it to the Office of Bronx Borough President. I am also a former state assembly member. I served for four years as a legislator in Albany, overseeing about $150 billion budget, dealing with issues before the state. So when I think about all of your work, as first responders and essential workers, as probation officers, uh, civilian members of the service and uniform members of the service. You are a valuable part of this work of keeping New Yorkers safe, of giving our young people a real chance at a real future. Um, I have been proud to work with the New York City Department of Probation, with Commissioner Bermudez and previous commissioners. And I'm also very proud to support the South Bronx NEON program. It is only one of a few programs we have. Uh, there is one in Brooklyn, in Brownsville, there's one in Harlem, um, and I know that we continue to grow. But the NEON program is something that I fundamentally believe in, and I'm grateful that it's offered not just to young people who are on probation, but young people in general, uh, because we realize that we have to work with those that may be involved in the criminal justice system, but those that are not. Um, I look at our work as not reactionary, for preventative work. We have to work on the front end to prevent young people from being involved in the criminal justice system in the first place. Um, and so in addition to NEON, into the work and services that are provided there on 161st Street, I also work very closely with your neighbors across the street at Bronx Community Solutions uh, with Maria Almonte and her team and Jennifer uh, and all the others. And I also do a lot of work with CCI, with Center for Court Innovation. I truly think the Bronx needs to have its own uh, community court. Um, I visited the one at Midtown, I visited the one in Red Hook, and I like what I see, and I would love for the Bronx to have its own community court. And I really, again, look at ways that we can continue to transform the system. We all have a role to play, but I also look at a lot of the things we do as being creative and innovative in our approach. Yes, we know that young people make mistakes. They are accused and sometimes convicted, of minor crimes, of low-level nonviolent offenses, but also of violent offenses too. And so I also believe that there's always a place for young people, but I look at rehabilitation. How can we prevent them from being repeat offenders? How can we break that vicious cycle that so many of your clients and my constituents fall victim to? Underemployment opportunities and poverty and lack of opportunity and lack of direction. They don't have safe spaces and programs and jobs and things that we know matter. And they shouldn't be offered when they're arrested. 
They should be offered before they get to the courthouse. I believe in that, and I know all of you do too. You don't necessarily want to see them when they're on probation, but rather when they're in school, when they are at their college graduation, or they're getting a scholarship, and I believe in that. And I also know that, you know, we have to believe that there are ways that we can eradicate gun violence, we can end mass incarceration, the school to prison pipeline, and so many things that have unfortunately plagued communities of color for far too long. But your work is critical. You are the ones that give our young people a real chance at a second, at a future. A lot of our young people have never been given a first chance. We often talk about second chance. Some of our young people need third, fourth, and fifth chances, and I realize that. Um, I, I make no excuses for some of the things that our people do, but I also know that there's a reason why, and there are root causes why young people engage in violence in the first place. And because we as a society have not addressed those societal issues and those root causes, sometimes that's why we're in the positions we're in today. But all of you play such a vital role and I have great respect and appreciation and admire all of our probation officers. And many of you I know I've worked with over the years and I appreciate the value you bring to our community. And as I look to this new position as Bronx Borough President, I take all of that um, in mind. I take all of that to heart. And I really want to build a borough that focuses on jobs and bringing and getting people back to work. Many of us are first responders and essential workers. So we had no choice. We had to go back to work. But many, many other residents uh, did not have that option and lost their job and their income. And many are rent burdened, many are struggling for basic necessities like healthy food and access to quality health care. So we have to focus on that and making sure that this borough is affordable. And we have to continue to build economic wealth and power and prosperity in our borough so that people have a real pathway to the middle class and have access to prevailing wage and union wage jobs. And we build and stabilize families because many of them have lost hope and have given up. But we are full of hope and we're full of optimism because we know that better and brighter days lie ahead. So I just wanna share with all of you just my vision. My campaign is called Forward Together Bronx because I truly believe that united we stand and divided we fall. We have to stand for something or we will fall for anything. And I believe in this work. I believe that I've been called to serve. I've never looked at this position ever as a job, but it has been a calling. I've been called to serve. And I truly know my faith is my foundation and I am committed and dedicated and invested in this work. Every day that I wake up, I'm always thinking of how I can make a difference, how I can help that mom whose child is in a criminal justice system and can't get out, or that young man that needs a scholarship or needs an apprenticeship program to become the next engineer or the next laborer or a painter so that they can have a real career. So I thank you all for your time today and I look forward to working with you. And should you have any questions, would love to hear from you, but definitely appreciate your work. Continue to be encouraged and know that we all have so much more to give. And I really wanna make sure that as a borough, we are stronger than ever before and healthier. And we really focus on the issues that matter to all Bronx children and families. Thank you so much. Mute myself. Thank you so much, sister. I know you gotta, you have another event you have to attend, so. I have um, time. Um, yeah, I'm not due until like 5.15, 5.20. Okay, anybody have, <laughs> all right, so. Um, anybody have any questions for Ms. Gibson they want to pose to her about her plans for the Bronx and a vision for us? Jennifer, anybody? Well, I have a question. So okay. I have a question. So there's this program called Officer Next Door Program, Good Neighbor Next Door Program, mm -hmm. where there's affordable, it's supposed to be like housing, um, where officers and teachers and can buy houses within the neighborhoods, keeping us in the neighborhood um, at uh, uh, you might want to look into it um, at a different at a, at a half the price to be able to buy homes in price. So my thing is, in order for us to stay in the communities, a lot of us can't afford homes in New York and in, in the five boroughs, right? So we tend to leave New, leave the five boroughs and go upstate, Long Island. Long Island. <laughs> so then you lose. Then people who run for office lose the votes because we now live someplace else. So I was just wondering, is that something that? It, the borough president, you being that, you being you, can look into something like that for officers who work in, especially in the Bronx or any other borough. I don't know if you get, how does that work? 
Yep, absolutely. So what we should be doing, and you know, we have a new administration coming into City Hall in January with the new mayor, and that'll be an entirely new administration. What I think we have to do is look at um, municipal housing for municipal workers, just like we have in new construction, we have set asides for different classes of residents, albeit seniors, veterans, foster youth, people with disabilities. There's a 50% set aside for the local community board. I've been asked by many educators that are UFT and CSA members about housing for them because a lot of our city workers can no longer afford to live in New York City and they're forced to move out. Um, I am a big proponent of ownership opportunities, of building more co-ops and condos and homes and working with organizations like Neighborhood Housing Services so that we can provide first time home buyer programs where you have incentives, right? And you offer discounts so that you can get the next homeowner, because we know in our communities, you know, let's be honest, right? Our credit won't get it sometimes. <laughs> and, and we just have a lot of barriers that just deny us the opportunity to get credit, to get loans, right? To be able to meet the down payment. And that's the, that the same goes for businesses too. Entrepreneurs struggle. Entrepreneurs of color, MWBEs, they don't have the capital. They don't have the assets to really put down on purchasing property. We don't own property. That's another one of our issues That's when right. you talk about ownership and economic wealth in communities of color. So I would be a supporter and as Bronx Borough President, my job would be to work with the administration on advancing those programs and moving them forward. And I think it's a worthy cause, it's reasonable because we always ask our municipal workers, just like we talk about police officers living in the five boroughs. You know, a lot of people have talked about that being expanded to everyone, but I don't think you can force people to live in New York City unless you make it more amenable and you make it affordable and more convenient. It's just like the idea of taking people out of cars and putting them on mass transit or bikes. No one's going to ride their bike, you know, from Rockland County. It just doesn't work. Right. Uh, and now, if we had, you know, if we had parking rides and we had Metro North stations, like we want to expand, if we had opportunities to make mass transit more accessible and affordable, then you would have people that would drive less and, and would use those different modes of transportation. So I believe in that. And I think the new administration can push that forward. And I would be an advocate in lifting that up as well in terms of the conversation. Let me ask another question. Um, you, you seem to know a lot. You do not seem, I know you know a lot about us because you live in the neon over in the farm. So yep. the question is, how do you, your vision for probation officers, right? And within the, the borough of the Bronx and trying to keep crime down. How, what is the role? How do you, how do you plan to work us into this whole criminal justice reform, mm -hmm. you know, even we're already on the way. We are, to my opinion, we are the solution because at the end of the day, reality is that there is going to always be crime and there's, at the same time, there has to be some accountability and that's what we do. So what, what role do you see us or how can you advocate or fit us into this whole a little bit more because I'm trying to get us Absolutely. Out that is a great point and I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, you have some extremists that want us to close Rikers Island and don't want us to build new jails. But when I ask the question, where do you place someone who's accused of assault or attempted murder or even murder? Do you send them home with the ankle bracelet? Do you put them in an ATI program? It just doesn't work. And I agree, we have to hold people accountable, particularly those that are repeat offenders that have continued to unfortunately be cycled in and out of the system. But I also know that a lot of people that are accused of crime, that have a criminal background and a criminal record, also have severe mental illness that has never been addressed. And that is one of the causes of why they're engaging in violence in the first place. So this work is really always about balance, supporting the work of law enforcement, but also making sure that we hold people accountable, holding everyone accountable, right? Both civilians, as well as uniformed members of the service. We've had bail reform, we have the legalization of marijuana. We have a lot of laws that have changed. People are now yelling about quality of life issues because they're not being addressed in a real, you know, in a real deliberate way. And people are very upset about the noise and just about the, the drag racing that you're seeing happening all over the city. And the summertime's not even here. Um, so the role I see probation officers playing is, as you said, is the solution to the problem. But what I wanna make sure we offer is we have to have programs for a lot of our clients. 
those that are on probation, we have to not only monitor them, but we have to look at what their home environment looks like, their vocation. Are they in school? Are they in college? Are they in a trade school? What are they doing with their extracurricular time? You know, a lot of that, you know, idle time is the devil at work. And I want to make sure that our youth and young adults, right? We say youth, but we mean young adults, that catchment of like the 16 to 30 year old, right? That's a big age range, but a lot of opportunity and a lot of potential. And I, I never want to write our young people off as society's failures, but I want to look at them, look at them at society's potentials. But we understand a lot of society has given up on them and they only see them as a statistic. And so to me, the first thing is we got to believe in them. We got to believe that they can do better. And although they may be on probation, that doesn't determine your future. No. What you have to make sure that they do is while they're on probation, are they going to be productive during that time? What types of programs do we have to keep them engaged? And that's why programs like NEON are so successful because you know we got the poet, we got the rapper, <laughs> we got the artist, the designer, but none of them have a space to even express themselves. And so that's to me why programs like that matter so much. What I love that we did with an organization, uh, I think it was called Children's Education Works Project. And we started putting artwork in family court so that it doesn't look like a courtroom when you walk in. And we had local students produce artwork so that it feels a little bit more family oriented. Things like that I love because you don't have to necessarily think you're in a courtroom, right? Um, a lot of our, my constituents don't wanna go into courts. They don't wanna go through metal detectors. Like I get it. It's just a real complicated scenario. But I do see the work of our POs as a critical one because you are in the middle of determining that young person's future but you also have to manage them and, yes. and be their source of encouragement when they have no one, usually no one in their families. Right. Hello? Their family has helped them and easily they could fall on that destructive path again. So to me, the goal again is to rehabilitate them. They should be better after they are off probation and not worse. I never come back. One of the questions Ooh. is, what's your view on the spike of violence? Oh. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> the spike of violence is complicated. Uh, we've been talking um, just consistently to NYPD. I speak to Commissioner Shea a lot. I had a press conference yesterday with some of my anti-gun violence organizations on the ground because June is Gun Violence Awareness Month, and I want to make sure we have a plan for the summer. I am trying, like all of you, to make sure that this is a safe summer 2021. I don't want to see kids assaulted and shot and killed in playgrounds and parks and walking down the street. It is painful. I have been a part of helping families, mothers and fathers mourn their kids. I've helped to pay for funerals. I've picked out caskets. I've done funeral programs. And I remind my people that this is not normal. Like we are dealing with so many plagues in our society. The plague of systemic racism. We're dealing with the plague of COVID-19 and the plague of gun violence. Number one, we have to have comprehensive gun reform at the federal level. We need to get a handle on the proliferation of guns coming into the Bronx and coming into New York City so easily. It's easy to get a gun. And then we also have to deal with the access. Why do young people think it's okay to carry a gun? But also, you know, the code of the streets and you know, your clients will tell you there are some beefs and wars and crews and they'll say, Miss Gibson, people gotta die. What? Like, I can't believe I hear these things sometimes mm -hmm. and I have my ear on the street. So I've been able to learn about all the different crews and I got a lot of crews in my district from 280 Six Wild, Burnside, River Park, 1600 Sedgwick, High Bridge fighting with Melrose, 169 Washington crew. I got them all, all over my community. And, and a lot of them, again, we have tried to work with these young people with Bronx Connect, with RTG, with Save Our Streets, with Guns Down Life Up. And a lot of people have said it's because we've let people out of, of city jails because of COVID. A lot of people have said it's related to bail reform and to the police not being able to do their job. And I understand all of that. I support bail reform. I support changing the system so young black and brown men and women are not trapped in the criminal justice system for low level nonviolent offenses. But if you are accused of a violent crime, I'm sorry, there has to be a place for you. I'm sorry. And, and, I, and I say that a lot of the advocates, sometimes they don't agree, but they don't talk to mothers like I do. They don't talk to the fathers like I do. I had a father last summer that was walking across Sheridan Avenue in 170, broad daylight Sunday afternoon, 
And guess what? Somebody shot him dead and his seven-year-old ran for her life. And then you know what his brother did? His brother came back a couple of hours and killed the three guys that shot his brother. And so it's like two families that will never be the same again. That I don't know how that's justice. And it's like, that's what our community sees all the time. And I welcome your ideas on how we can break this vicious cycle. Because sometimes it's like, I'm not cool enough. I'm not young enough to talk to the young people. I occupy the block, I occupy the corner. We go out Saturday nights and we talk to the young people. And we tell them, listen, we got jobs for you. We got programs for you. All I need you to do is take that first step. But you know, the challenge that we have is that these same young people are stuck in the community. And so even if we take them off that corner and we give them a job, they still got to go home to the same neighborhood at night. And it's not cool that you are not down with the same crew and you got a job. So now you think you better than us. And, 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 and that's what my young people are telling me. And so I, I'm trying, y'all. I'm trying to figure this all out because it's like, it's not normal. And I just want our young people to be safe. So when you become the borough president, maybe you can invite us to the table because we boots on the ground. And, yeah. um, and we find that when the administrators who's never done our jobs, they could talk theory and all the other stuff, but we could talk it all. Because we live it, we do it, we're part of yeah, it. So every day. I'm asking to be invited and whatever, however you want to formulate this, this little committee, that we could be a part of the conversation because we're just starting to get into the scene um, because people didn't know who probation was, other than you. Very few know who I was. So at the end of the day, who we were, they didn't, I'm telling you. Um, so now that we're here, we want to make sure that we get a seat at the table. We have you see the question? Uh no, Boy, I didn't look at the chat. What was the question? Uh, who are you supporting for me? I understand you may have shifted your support. Is this correct? May you, may we know why? Also, was your position with the new marijuana laws and its impacts quality of life versus cost benefits to the community and the possibility of small business enterprises? I think you covered that. Already. Yeah, no, I didn't talk about marijuana legalization. So that was done uh, a few months ago in Albany, where I no longer serve. I'm now in the city council. But I support marijuana legalization. I think it was long overdue that New York finally joined about 20 other states and legalized marijuana for a couple of reasons, because of the systemic practice of racism where we've seen you know, the harsh reality of marijuana arrest perpetuated in communities of color, when we all know that it's not just young people of color that are smoking marijuana. Um, I, I believe in that fundamental change. I also believe when you talk about reparations and you talk about economic revenue, I also think there's a way where you can have proprietors and those that are dispensers that are administering marijuana actually make a profit and provide a real revenue for the local economy as well as jobs. I just think it has to be done in a responsible way. And because the law is new, a lot of people don't know what it means. I get a lot of concern from the older generation because there's a huge gap when you talk about legalizing marijuana. Young people, everybody else get excited and they don't realize that there are still laws. You can't just walk down the street with a joint in your hand like you're still subject to some of the provisions just like you know being uh, 21 and, and being able to, to drink alcohol. It's the same thing. So I think we have to do a lot of education on the ground. I have heard some concerns from NYPD as far as like traffic stops where they were able to stop you because they smelled marijuana. And now because of the legalization of it, they no longer can do that. And they were able to get a lot of gun arrests out of those traffic stops. So that is a little bit concerning to me because we have so many guns in our community. Um, I do think that there is a way again to kind of right a lot of the wrongs that have happened in the system as it relates to marijuana. Um, and so I'm hoping that the state legislators, they come out with a, a big ambitious, almost like a PSA, a public service announcement, because we definitely have to have a lot of education. People are very worried. Nobody wants to step over 50 people smoking marijuana as they go into their building. And a lot of people are fearful of that. I'm in my apartment and I have to smell it every single day. And so I, I am very concerned because we have a lot of people with asthma and health disparities and, and so many other underlying conditions that could be exacerbated by marijuana. But again, I do support it. Um, I definitely think that there's a lot we have to do around education and it has to be done in a responsible way. Um, as far as mayor, I have a relationship with most of the candidates and thankfully with ranked choice voting, 
I have five <laughs> candidates that I will, I will, because it's just way too much. I don't think any candidate gets 50% on election night. Um, and so obviously I'm looking at Andrew Yang. Um, Eric Adams is a friend of mine. I've known him for many, many years. Um, I do like Kathy Garcia because she has great managerial skills uh, in her former capacities as sanitation um, commissioner and food czar. Um, I do like Maya Wiley. Uh, she's a little concerning on the NYPD issues. It's just a little concerning for me because um, she keeps talking about defunding NYPD. And I'm like, no, we can't have that conversation again. And crime is through the roof. Um, so I'm concerned about that. And um, who else is in the race? I think Wayne McGuire is okay. He's just not been doing very well in the polls. And I, you know, it's just been concerning to me. A lot of people call him the rich guy. <laughs> uh, and, and I just don't see him gaining a lot of traction. But I do think that we will have either Yang, Adams, Garcia, and potentially Wiley as the top four contenders, I think. That's just my projection. Let me ask you a question. Okay. Is, are they thinking of a device when we were going back to the marijuana discussion? If they're going to, because when, when you start for DWI, there's a way to do a breathalyzer. breathalyzer yeah. We have a unit. We have a unit. Um, what's the name of that unit, y'all? The unit that we have for the um those DWI cases where they can they have to correct you're the supervisor for that, right? Um, there's a unit that we have to deal with DWIs, and they have to have this device in their car, they have to blow into the um the tube or whatever. Are they going to create, you think they're going to create something or would you push for something down the road to when they're stopped or if we have cases like that, they could check for the marijuana. How can you check for marijuana? But I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. And that was one of the concerns that NYPD raised about legalizing marijuana because you could have someone potentially under the influence of marijuana and driving behind the wheel. That is very scary. Um, as someone who lost a family friend due to a reckless driver, he was killed in the crosswalk going to pick his daughter up from daycare and he never made it. And I feel some kind of way about that. So I, I don't know if there's anything right now, but I would say that there should be something. And hopefully it can come from either the NYPD, because I think, again, they are the best equipped because they have already the mechanisms as you guys do, but there has to be some sort of way uh, where you determine, I guess, so to speak, if someone's under the influence, right? Right. Yeah, we have yeah. the interlock. That's what it's called, the interlock. It just came to my brain. Um, any more? Okay, an important point. Okay, any more questions? Are y'all good? Do you have any questions for us? No, just I thank you all for your work, and I look forward to our continued work. And, you know, for those of you that live in the Bronx, you have an opportunity to vote on Tuesday, June 22nd for the next Democratic candidate for Bronx Borough President. Early voting starts on Saturday, June 12th. And I certainly hope you will look at our website, which is gibsonbp2021.com, and you will see the work that we've done in the council, uh, the work around women's issues, reproductive health care, health equity, health justice, economic wealth and power. I mean, I'm really trying to build it all. I'm really trying to get us back to a place of stability because we've really been set back by COVID. Uh, we've lost people, people of color, highest death rate. And we just have so much to deal with in the Bronx. But I believe I am that leader that can lead us through a recovery, uh, that can lead us through economic you know, prosperity and really provide the opportunities that so many of our people uh, rightfully need. One more thing, as far as programming and proactivity, are you planning on spreading the love for programs throughout all, five, all, all components areas of the Bronx, including Uptown Bronx, Northeast Bronx? Absolutely. So when I become Bronx Board President, I'll have a, a much higher staff. I have I have seven members now <laughs> of my staff. So it is hard to run a council district and also run a borough wide campaign. But the good thing about the Bronx is we have a lot of advocates, a lot of activists, a lot of stakeholders, and I've been able to assemble relationships with many of them. So getting the borough hall and transitioning to a, a much larger staff, I just have to have my transition team help me learn about all of the issues, which I pretty much have a good handle on what's happening across the Bronx. And even as I visit different neighborhoods, you have a lot of people in the Bronx that care about certain things versus others. And so when I'm in like City Island, Throgs Neck and Silver Beach, right, and Edgewater, I hear different things from Kingsbridge to Highbridge to Mount Haven and Millbrook. I mean, it's just different. 
But there are a lot of common things that we've all come together on. And I think generally public safety is the number one issue that a lot of people are worried about. They are worried about themselves and their children. They're seeing Asian Americans and Jewish people being attacked and assaulted in the street randomly. They're seeing seniors being knocked in their head for money. And um, I mean, my goodness, we've never had an environment like this. And people are very worried. Homeowners are saying to me, Ms. Gibson, I don't know that I can live here anymore. My property value, I can't deal with the noise, the music, the trash. It's like the city's going down and yeah, a lot yeah. of people feel that way. Yeah. And so we have to have strong leadership that gives us that hope and that optimism, but starts to put programs and places like, yeah, we need to get back to picking up our garbage and cleaning the parks. Like those things matter <laughs> to our people. They do. And we've never seen it matter like last year when we cut budgets and, you know, you had no, no pickups all the time, but now people realize, yeah, your garbage pickups important. Um, and so, you know, I definitely think that the Bronx is ready for leadership. Yeah. The city is ready for new leadership. And I hope all of you will support us and join us on this campaign. There are 19 days left to go. And so we're going to say thank you for joining us. I will circle back around with you at a later date. Okay. And one of my members said, we hope, she hopes that you run for mayor, like uh, right no. now. <laughs> no, <laughs> thank we'll you. That turn, right? <laughs> All right, you have a good No, day. only if that's God's plan. <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, officers. God bless you guys. Please stay safe, be encouraged. That's Thanks right. again. Take care, everyone. Oh, that was great. Okay. Was I talking? Can you? Okay, hi. I'm back. Am I back, Sandra? Joanne? Jennifer? Jennifer? Okay, I'm back. So that was so that's that was um council member Vanessa Gibson, who's running for Bronx Borough President. She'll be the first female um if elected and female of color. So you all who live in the Bronx, you use your discretion wisely. Um, accordingly. Um, so recently, before I go into anything else, recently a new development came up about the consent to search. Now, um, I got a couple of phone calls. I saw some memos and stuff. We have been, the consent to search is checked off as number 28 on your conditions of probation. And on the conditions of probation, it says it can be conducted by a probation officer. Now I understand that in the past that the consent to search was done by Intel or even rapid response team. I don't know why, what, what the dynamics because it's still very new coming to my attention. I don't know why the deputy commissioner changed it to now she want all the officers to do the um, in general adults, adult, I'm talking about adult supervision to do their own consent to search. I have to find out why, but I did talk to um, Harry had to go, but we did talk about it. Um, there's nothing in violation of our job. If I looked at the job description, and our responsibilities. There's nothing saying that we can't do it. The condition of probation clearly says it. Um, all we, we will be doing is having a meeting with administration to find out where this is coming from, why is it happening. We will be asking for um, training and, and proper PPE and equipment. I understand that based on the memo that I did see that if you are going out for, and, and you have to conduct the consent to search that you do have the opportunity to have Intel and um, rapid response team to join you in this endeavor. Um, I, my concern is that we have some officers who's in a general, gen, general supervision component that's not armed and has not been properly trained. So that's a concern of mine. Um, and that's something that I will address. And once I know of um, exactly this lack of training. So we have to find out how, that, how this is gonna, happen because um, it's a concern. Can we tell them the cease and desist? We asked them to hold back, but we can't because it's somewhere and it's in your job description, but you're not properly trained. So that's where I'm at. I'm going to have a meeting with administration to find out about the training. Wayne did mention something about training to me, but then something happened and I had to jump off the call. So once I find out more information, I'll get back to you guys because what do you do if you go into a home and you see and you find some marijuana, I mean, I, I guess, I don't know about marijuana, but like cocaine, or you find an arsenal of guns and stuff, what are you supposed to do? How many of you know what, exa what exactly you're supposed to do in that situation? Are you supposed to make an arrest? Are you even trained on making an arrest? There's a whole lot of questions that we need to find out and, and it, and it could be very dangerous. So we have to make sure that um, 
we know what to do in those cases. So I will um, get back to you on, on that one, okay? All right, so then the next thing I wanna talk about is the claim forms. Um, once again, I've mentioned in several meetings that if you do not, even though you have the, the privilege now, which is a great, the convenience of uploading your claims into the system, we still ask that you, sub, that you submit the claims with the proper claim form. So the, the claims, whether you mail it or, or, or you upload it, we still require the proper optical form, prescription form, because if it's not included, it's going to be denied. And some of you will be getting some um, explanation of benefits in the mail telling you that we need the proper claim forms because when we get audited, the city looks at all that stuff. So we ask you, just like the same way you mailed in the claim form with the receipts, we need you to upload the claim form with the receipts, okay? It'll be, I've said it all this back and forth. That's one thing. And right now, as we speak, we are developing new claim forms and trying, and what we're gonna do is have each, 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 um, instead of having like on the medical form, we have all these different categories. And what we wanna do is separate the forms and have separate forms for each different, it's, you know, topic, like, like optical, optical already has their own form. Prescription has their own form, but hearing aid have their own form. The, um, the non-drug non prescript or your co-pays, they all gonna have their own individual form. So that's coming and being worked on in, in the meantime. The, the summary benefits plan description books for the active is almost, it's at its last stages. That's where we give you all the description of your benefits. So we're at the last stages of that. The trustees are gonna meet um, for two, two, two times this, this month to finalize the language and up and make sure that we are on the same page when it comes to the, the um, dollar amounts and make sure that the, the, the verbiage is very clear. And hopefully, I don't, and then we have to do another run with the lawyers again. I'm hoping by, I'm gonna say September at the extreme, but hopefully we'll have them out and they'll start off on the website first. It'll be very interactive. And once we get our monies back from the city that we defer to, to, to prevent layoffs, we'll do a massive mailing and we'll mail the books to everybody. And then we will start on the retirees books, which shouldn't take that long because the um, active is the, is the foundation for the retirees. My, my, our issue, our cons what we need you to do is make sure that your address is right and up to date in our system. Online, there's an, Charlene, isn't there an address, um, change of address form online? Charlene, is she there? I think online, Charlene has a change of address form. So you need to go online. Yeah, you could either change it on asonet.com or if you go into UPOA website under members, there's a change of address. So they can directly do it into their own ASO account. Correct, yeah. So if you have not set up your ASO account, Tanja, don't you have a step-by-step -step on, the, on the website mm -hmm. on how to update, how to in, get into the ASO net? Yes, I do. All right, so you can go it's to the under website. membership. Under membership, if you have not enrolled in the ASO, asonet.com, set up your accounts. And and because right now we're trying, I'm trying to make it as convenient and, and modern as possible for you guys. And that's for active and retired. Mm -hmm. You can go up to the website and you go under membership and you get the step by step instruction how to open up your own e folder. And I've been saying it over and over again your own e folder. And you can, like Charlene said, go up there and you can change your address. You can go in there and you can scan up your claims with the forms and try to make as convenient as possible. So when we do these mailings, we don't want mail, we don't want these, these to come back. We want to make sure everybody gets a hard copy of their um of their summary benefits book. Um the in the change address line. So I think that's it. The voting is June 22nd. We're voting for mayor, we're voting for city council people, we're voting for um um, advocate city controller. There's a lot of different um, people running for different uh, different um, positions, and um, we want you to get out there and we want you to vote. This ranked choice voting, I don't, um, you know, it is what it is. You got your first, second, third. You might just have one, and then you have your just your one um, person that you're going to choose. Um, so early voting starts on June 12th, and. I think that's it. If we hear anything else about the early retirement, we will let you know. Joanne's gonna say a couple of words to her retirees before we close out. 
Joanne? Where's Joanne? Is she there? I don't know. Good, good evening, my fellow retirees. Um, I'm wishing you a happy and safe summer. Um, as always, you can call the union office if you need any, any assistance. We are there for you. But I just want to thank you all for, um, I thank you for um, calling up. If you have an issue, hopefully we can resolve it. If not, we can steer you in the right direction. I thank my committee because they work hard and tireless in order to um, move forward with updating you on your benefits. Again, I thank you. Have a safe and prosperous summer. And for the retirees, what we did was we got you guys a, a PBA card, retiree membership for life. So you'll get, when we mail out the um, benefits books to you guys, we're going to enclose these, we, these um, PBA cards. This is your one-time shot deal card. You won't be getting a card every year, but you guys are retired. So we, um, you'll be you're getting them. That's why there's a lot of things that we're going to be mailing out in the future that we have to make sure we have the right addresses. And come September... I will be coming back to the boroughs and having in-person meetings with everyone. I will let you know when I'm coming to the boroughs in advance. The retirees will continue to do it. You know, if they want to come to the borough, fine. But Joanne might you might want to have your own meeting for the retirees. But for the active, I will be coming back to the boroughs. The world is now open, and um, I will be seeing you guys in September. I don't know what my first stop is going to be, but me and Jennifer might be stopping by Staten Island sometime this month anyway. Just to, just to stop by and talk and do some health check-ins and see what's going on. So with that said, I want to wish everybody a wonderful... Oh, and somebody asked us about the 25 and our 25 and out bill. Um, we have to find somebody. I did talk to the lobbyists about that. And we got to... Um, it fell off the calendar, honestly, with all that COVID and stuff that was going on. So me and the lobbyists was talking today and we're getting ready to get out there, hit the pavement and start having conversations with people and start getting that back on the, um, back on the, back on track with that again, years of retirement especially. So that's where we at with that right now, okay? So as the world turns, as the world opens, I wish you all much love. You have a wonderful summer, you be safe. And I am still around, I'm not going nowhere. Call me on the telephone anytime, all right? And somebody asked about returning to work five days a week. I don't know about that. If they I haven't heard that yet. As far as I know, we still at 50%. So if you heard anything different, you know, you can let me know. But at the end of the day, we can't stop them from having you come to work five days a week. It's an operational need. So I'm going to shut it down for the night. And y'all take care. Tanja, anybody else? That's it. Good night. T? No attendance. For who? For whoever's on. Because I... Whoever's on the call, we can see who's on. I got, I got um most of the delegates and executive board, and we can see who's on the call. Well, oh, okay. some of them just says iPhone and all that. So yeah, I don't know who the iPhone people. They are. need to try to put their name in so I can know who it is. Who? Um, you got the right. phone number? Huh? Yeah, because I'm not. I'm on my phone. Who's that? Okay. Lawton, who? I'm on my phone because I'm in. I'm in Brooklyn. Lord, I see you. But Miss Lawton, we see your name. We see your name, Kai. Oh, we you do? You. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Kai, we okay. know you here, Kai. You ain't got to put your name in loud. <laughs> no, because I didn't know if you could see me. I, I mean, I didn't know if you Sandra, saw me. Sandra, you I have everybody on. else for the attendance. I just got the um executive board people. Okay, this is what I got. I got, all right, don't go nowhere, y'all. I know Erica Otero is here. We got Jennifer, R.C., Anita, Beverly, Y'all want to shout out Evelyn, Lou. Uh, Y'all got the names on the side? Voice, Flo Johnson, Hicks, hey, and um, Jacinta, and Jean Brown, Jim Simmons, Freya, Kai, um, Karen Chow. Kai, yeah, shut up. Sheila is loud. She's Sheila, Helena Campbell, Yvonne Hernandez. They all saying they're here. I love it. Um. Oh yeah, next year, let me, before you bounce, next year, we looking to do something because we need to have some fun and we have a credit with Anton's. I can't make a promise yet because I got to see how the world is going to be next year. 
but we might be doing a little something, get a little loosen up a little something, have a little get a little dance on a little health and wellness event next year. It'll include the retirees and the active, but I'm talking in advance, so don't hold me to it. But we got to do something with that credit. So next year, you know, y'all about to get yourselves in shape and get your dance shoes going on because I got a funny feeling I'm getting a twitch that we need to um we need to do something. And y'all deserve it. Y'all been working really hard. So with Regina Canty's here, she said, have a good night. I guess I'm talking too much. Y'all can go ahead. Y'all have a good night. Get home safe. Don't talk to no strangers. That's it. Good night. Kathy's on. Good night. Kathy, well. Me, hey, Boo, call the meeting. Kathy. Kathy, Xavier Shaw is on. I'm sorry. The time is 528. Meeting shall come to an end. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.